is Rachel Stevens. I'm the chair of the Vermont chapter of the Sierra Club, and I just want to welcome you uh, this evening to a Women in Conservation event. Um, this event is sponsored by the Upper Valley Group of the Sierra Club, which is a distinct um, kind of a subset of our chapter that operates here uh, in the Upper Valley. Um, could everyone who's a member of the Upper Valley Group just raise your hand? Thank you so much for this great event. We're glad to be here. Um, so I encourage you afterwards to, we'll stick around and mingle, um, but there's a lot of ways that you can get involved with the Sierra Club and the Upper Valley Group. Um, the group uh, is involved in uh, outings in the area, hikes, walks in the area, um, lectures and forums like this one where we can hear from engaging panelists that work in the area of environmental conservation. Um, and also bringing national campaigns to the Upper Valley. So the, the main one that's going on that's a national campaign in this area is called Ready for 100% Renewable Energy. Um, and Hanover uh, is one of the first um, cities in this area that's signed on to that uh, campaign. So if you want to get involved in any of those um, campaigns or activities, please sign up at the back so we have your contact information or stick around um, so we can talk to you about uh, the great work that we can do. Um, so I also want to mention that the Upper Valley Group meets once a month at the Howe Library from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Um, and if you want to participate in these regular meetings of the Executive Committee, um, just find anyone who's a member here or sign up in the back. Um, so yeah, so thank you so much for being here. This is a um, especially um, interesting event for me to participate in because I also work in the area of conservation um, as an environmental lawyer and through volunteerism and I'm just really inspired by um, the people that we have today to speak. So I'll just introduce them. Um, first up, we've got Anna Morris. Anna Morris is the lead educator at VINS, where she teaches informal programs featuring native North American birds of prey. She's worked with wild birds at the Raptor Trust, the Cornell Raptor Program, and the World Center of Birds of Prey. And she studied, oh, I can't even pronounce this word, straight, straighted? Strided. Strided. Um, carcasses in the Falkland Islands um, while completing her master's degree at Boise State University. She's won numerous awards and honors and is a poet, photographer, and artist. Um, I'd also like to introduce um, Cheryl Asa, Asa. Asa, I'm sorry, um, who has nearly 30 years of research experience in comparative reproductive physiology and behavior of numerous species as the director of research at the St. Louis Zoo. She retired to Norwich, Vermont in 2016 and still works with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service who continues to fund her work with endangered Mexican wolves. She also serves as a scientific advisor for management of wild horses. Dr. Asa holds an undergraduate degree in zoology and psychology and a PhD in endocrinology and reproductive physiology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So first, um, please uh, join me in welcoming Anna Morris, who's going to start off. Thank you. All right. Um, my name is Anna Morris. Hi, everyone. And uh, yeah, I'm the lead environmental educator at VINS, um, which if, how many of you have ever been to VINS? You're probably a little bit familiar, right? It looks like this uh, in the summertime. Now it's covered in snow. Uh, but our mission is to motivate people to care about the environment uh, and to come together as communities to conserve the environment. And Vince has been doing this since 1972 in the Upper Valley region. I just got involved with Vince about two and a half years ago. And I am, as uh, the lead environmental educator, most of my job has to do with conducting these outdoor uh, informal and formal education programs with our collection of education birds. Um, we have 15 education raptors, including red-tailed hawks and American kestrels. Uh, we have a black vulture and a turkey vulture, various different kinds of owls. Uh, and we use these birds particularly to help teach um, different environmental concepts, like sentinel species, <coughs> like keystone species, um, like uh, the food chain and trophic cascades and things like that, because raptors, birds of prey are pretty charismatic. Um, but one thing I always begin my programs with uh, is asking people, what do you think of when you hear the word raptor? And I get a couple of different answers. There's a, a truck that Ford makes a truck called the Raptor. There's a helicopter. Uh, there's a basketball team in Toronto. And there are dinosaurs as well. And about 95% of the time, I hear, oh, yes, dinosaurs, of course. And then people are disappointed to then meet birds. No, they're never disappointed. Um, but I thought I'd start out because my presentation is going to focus a lot on raptors. And my work with raptors is how do we define what a raptor is? 
Um, there are exceptions to all of these things, but we talk about four different traits that raptors share. They're carnivorous birds, so they depend uh, on meat to survive. They only get their energy from meat. They have forward-facing eyes for binocular vision, sort of the same way that we do. They have great depth perception with their eyes and great visual acuity as well. Uh, they have strong, sharp talons for catching and for killing their prey. And so you'll notice when uh, people handle raptors, they handle them with a thick leather glove on to protect their hands from those talons. And they also have a curved or a hooked beak right on the end of their face for ripping and tearing up their prey. I also threw in, in very tiny text there, reverse sexual size dimorphism. That's another trait that raptors share. It's that the females are actually larger than the males by almost a third in some species, um, especially the falcons. So uh, that's kind of interesting and very, very different from other groups of birds. Um, ooh, that got bold for some reason. There we go. So when I was younger, I was about 11 years old. Um, my parents took me to a nature center local to where I grew up in New Jersey, Trailside Nature Center, and there was a woman there from the Raptor Trust who brought out an owl on her glove. And little 11-year-old me thought that is the coolest possible job that anyone could ever hope to have. And so I, I set my mind to becoming that person uh, one day. Um, she brought out a barn owl. Here's our, our barred owl at Vince Troy. And so that is exactly what I get to do every day that I work at Vince. I get to handle our birds of prey. I get to teach people about them and tell them how cool they are, and what they do for us, how we rely heavily on them for our own health in our environment. So this is Chesterland. Uh, he is our Harris's hawk, which is not a native Vermont species. He's the only one we teach with that is definitely not a native Vermont species, but he's so cool to work with anyway. And we do um, flight demonstrations with him. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about my journey to this point, uh, how I got from that little 11 year old to being here today and, and working at Vins. And I'll talk a little bit about my uh, graduate research with birds as well. So uh, when I was 11, right after that program, I emailed the Raptor Trust and I said, hey, can I volunteer with you guys? Can I do something, uh, help out with your birds? And they said, well, you have to be 17. So I waited six years and then I emailed them back. Uh, and they said, well, you have to be 18. And I was like, oh, come on, no. So they took me on uh, and I, I started volunteering and I volunteered uh, every week throughout that year. And they hired me on as uh, summer staff. What the Raptor Trust mainly deals with is uh, wild songbirds. They see between three and 4,000 wild songbirds every year through their rehab hospital, and their goal is to get all of them back out in the wild. We do a similar thing at Vince. We have a rehab hospital. We see uh, only about 600 birds a year, but it's still quite a bit. So I was in charge of keeping uh, all of our little ducklings there uh, fed and watered. And they needed their food changed out every two hours because they go through a pile of duckweed that fast. And also, uh, every hour, our little nestling songbirds need to get fed. So I worked with that uh, pile of baby robins. There's a mockingbird and a grackle uh, in there as well. So that was really my start in working with wild uh, North American species, which is a pretty rare opportunity. Because of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act here in the United States, it's not legal for a private citizen to take in, to own, or even to care for any of our native uh, North American wild bird species. You can't have a, a robin or a kestrel as a pet in your own home. So this was something uh, particularly special, and I, I think I had a sense of that at the time. Now, when I went off to college, I knew I wanted to continue to work with birds in some way, and of course, still working my way towards raptors, I got involved with the raptor program at my university, Cornell. They actually have a whole division off of the veterinary department called the Cornell Raptor Program. They house about, when I was there, we had about 42 educational raptors. And the goal with these birds was not only to do educational outreach, we brought them to local schools and libraries uh, and around the Cornell campus as well, but to teach students about husbandry of these birds and about their veterinary care. So we would learn a little bit about how to properly house them. Uh, our mentor was a man named uh, Dr. John Parks, who was also a master falconer. So he taught us about those kind of training methods and techniques as well. 
we uh, had a flight cage and we rehabilitated birds from the Cornell Hospital's uh, uh, wildlife ward, basically tested their uh, flight ability and their hunting ability and then would release them on site. So there's uh, two of our little American kestrels showing them off at the um, annual veterinary college open house. So that was a great introduction to me for how these birds are housed and how you interact with them in captivity. But I wanted a, a little bit more even than that. Um, so one summer during college, I had the privilege of working at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary in Pennsylvania. This is the view from the North Lookout at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, if any of you have ever been there. Uh, if you haven't, I highly encourage you to go. Probably not right now. Um, probably in March or April, uh, maybe even next October. And Hawk Mountain Sanctuary was founded in 1932 uh, by a woman named Rosalie Edge, who has become definitely my favorite naturalist. Uh, she saw that there was this property uh, out in the uh, Kittatinny Ridge in the Appalachian Mountains where people would go on their weekends and shoot hawks. It was just a fun thing to do. Back in 1932, that was perfectly legal, and in fact, the Fish and Wildlife Department saw it as a good deed for the community if you were going out and shooting these animals because they were viewed as pests. Imagine if you are a hunter and you go out to shoot some quail or some ducks to bring home meat for your family and a peregrine falcon or a northern goshawk takes that bird away from you. You're going to want to shoot the hawk or the falcon right afterward. And so that's what people did. They considered it. They were removing this pest species from the environment. But Rosalie Edge, pioneering woman that she was, saw that this is a very, very, very bad idea. Our ecosystems are regulated in kind of a top-down way from the predators ensuring that prey populations remain healthy. So she couldn't really get the local government to do anything about it. She was a rich lady. She just bought the property. And she put up no trespassing signs. And people couldn't come up and shoot the hawks anymore because she owned that land. And it's become a, a scientific research institution focused on conserving birds of prey worldwide, not just in Pennsylvania. So I uh, had the privilege of studying wild kestrels there for uh, one summer with an uh, Armenian researcher and was mentored by Dr. Keith Bildstein, who um, was the director of the Ecopian Center for Conservation Science. He recently retired. And so uh, as I went through this and I got this view into the research world, I thought, yeah, this is really cool. I should do more of this. I, I want to get to know these wild raptors in their own habitat, doing their own natural behaviors, somewhat different from the experience in the raptor program. So when it came time to go to graduate school, I was knowing that I wanted to work with birds of prey, I talked to Dr. Bildstein and I said, who do you know that would be able to take me on, who has funding right now, that's always the story with grad school, uh, and also is working on some really, really cool and interesting uh, birds of prey. And he said, he thought about it for a minute, suggested a couple of different people. And then he said, how good are you with going without internet for two months? And I said, um, I think I can do that. And so he said, OK, you're going to the Falkland Islands with me. So um, this is where we are in the Monshire. That's the Falkland Islands. Um, they're a tiny little archipelago of about 700 islands off the coast of Argentina in South America. And they're home to an extremely, extremely unique, so unique it's hard to explain to other biologists how cool these birds are, bird called a striated caracara. So this is kind of what the landscape looks like in the Falklands, um, characterized by these tussocks of grass. They just call it tussock grass. Uh, there are very few trees. Again, it's an island in the South Atlantic. It's extremely windy. There's one little a uh, square mile of trees outside of the capital city. That's where they get their Christmas trees from, and there's no other trees on, on the whole island. Um, so this is a view from Saunders. And this is a striated caracara. And they look really beautiful in this picture. This is a full adult caracara. Um, but you kind of need to see them in action, so I have this video here. Hopefully that will start playing. Can you play? Oh, there we go. There's some caracaras in action. Um, the reason that they're so unique is they're, one, the most southerly distributed raptor in the world. You go to Antarctica, there are not raptors there, they're just penguins. Um, but if you go to Tierra del Fuego or the Falklands, you will see the striated caracaras. 
And Caracaras are related to falcons, of all things. The falcon family sort of splits into two groups, the true falcons, which contain peregrine falcons, prairie falcons, jeer falcons, and things like that, and then the Caracaras, of which there are only nine living species, one of them being the striated guys. And they behave in weird ways because they're not like falcons really at all. They don't have long pointed wings and a long tail for diving on top of their prey and maneuvering around. They have sort of rounded off wings the way that a red-tailed hawk might. They're about the size of a red-tailed hawk. And they're incredibly social, as you can probably see. You don't see a group of red-tailed hawks hanging out on the ground like this. It just doesn't happen. Caracaras are naturally social. They're naturally very curious and playful. Um, their, their curiosity and playfulness made my research somewhat difficult, as we will see in the future. Um, so in that sense, they also behave a lot like crows, a lot like corvids. There are no naturally occurring corvids in South America, as we will see, so they've kind of taken over that niche. But in another way, they also behave a lot like vultures. They're scavengers. Um, they're known as clumsy predators by uh, scientists that study them, of which there are very few, actually. Uh, it's said by Falkland farmers that they will kill sheep, and so they've been persecuted by farmers in the Falklands for 250 years, for however long uh, uh, the English have been occupying the Falklands. But uh, they only really eat dead things, like vultures do sharp talons and a strong hooked beak, but they're more interested in going after something that is lying on the ground already dead, such as the goose carcass that they're working on there. And this whole concept fascinated me, this underdog of a raptor, that nobody really likes them. They're kind of like dirty brown. They wander around on the ground eating dead stuff. Scavengers as a whole have a pretty bad rap. You look at scavengers' representations in cartoons, like Wile E. Coyote, he's kind of the road ro runner always outsmarts him, and they have Beaky Buzzard and the four goofy vultures from the Jungle Book. We either see scavengers as witless or straight up evil, these vultures as uh, a comparison for people that take advantage of other people when they're in a bad spot. But I knew, because I knew raptors, that this just wasn't true. Vultures are beautiful. And vultures are very, very necessary for the health of our ecosystem. They prevent the spread of disease. They help clean up our environment so that insects and uh, other vermin species don't breed. Uh, so there's a king vulture on the left. They're from South America. And a lammergeer, or a bearded vulture, on the right. They're from uh, northern Africa and Europe. And so I thought, someone needs to tell the Caracara story because they are really, really awesome too. Despite being these persecuted scavengers that may or may not kill sheep, they're pretty beautiful in themselves. And they're super playful and they do silly things. Um, There's a, a camera I had set up uh, to film one of my carcass trials that I'll talk about in a minute. They got really curious about that. There was a, a boat, an old, um, it was actually a, Argentine war boat from the Falklands War that had just washed up on a beach and was, had been sitting there for the past 30 years. They like to sit on the steering wheel and look out the window. Um, and I was there in the summer for my graduate studies, June, July, August, which of course is winter in the Southern Hemisphere, so it snowed a lot, and I'd make little snow caracaras, which they found endlessly entertaining. So they'd just take them apart with their feet. Oh, and there's another one down there dragging a bicycle tire around, great. I also knew from reading and doing some research for my graduate studies that there was another bird out there in the world that had a similar bad rap that had been completely turned around just because people had learned their story. And that bird is the kia. Kias are found in New Zealand. They're a uh, flighted parrot, so not like the kakapo. The kakapo is another New Zealand parrot. They're flightless, they're ground dwelling, they live in forests and they're nocturnal, just like doing all the opposite parrot things that they could think of. Um, but kia are large parrots that are incredibly destructive. They have a beak like a can opener. They will take the uh, windshield wipers and the little rubber insulation off of your car. If you leave it parked in an area, they'll move traffic cones, they'll steal your cell phone. And yet people go to Arthur's Pass in New Zealand specifically to see these amazing kia birds because they're, they're so, there's something about them that's really human because they're so playful and they get up to no good. Um, so there's some ecotourism that has been fueled by this knowledge of 
what the Kia does and their behavior. So I hope that people would find uh, the Caracaras just as endearing. There's a picture I took of uh, a, an adult pair of Caracaras that kind of ruled the roost where I was living in the Falklands. Is R1 Green, the female, who's sitting on the, the caterpillar there. She's got her head stuffed up in the feathers of her mate, G1 Yellow. Um, she's asking him to preen her, which she did very often, just run his beak down her feathers and clean those feathers, and I never saw her return the favor. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, please clean me. And so, yeah, this is, a, this is a map of the distribution of corvid species, crows, ravens, and jays, across the world. All the green spaces are where you find any kind of corvid species. So yeah, in the United States, we've got crows and ravens and blue jays, many, many different kinds of jays. All over Asia, Africa, Australia, the northern part of South America, <coughs> and then the very southern part of South America, where you find this dryad caracara, there are no corvids. So they've clearly taken up this niche of being um, not, not necessarily omnivorous, but very diverse in their uh, abilities to find food in different places. So uh, I did two different kinds of experiments working with these birds. The one was with experimental carcasses. So I used mutton shoulders, who's living at a sheep farm, and uh, upland goose carcasses. They're, the upland goose is like their Canada goose. They're everywhere. Um, and I would put one of these carcasses outside for uh, a period of time, two or three times a week. Okay. And this is one of the first places where, when in doing my thesis proposal to my fellow graduate students and in my graduate department, people would say, well, wait a minute. You just put it kind of outside. Where do you stand? How do you observe these wild birds? Do you have like a blind set up? How long is the blind set up before you go into it? Aren't you going to scare the birds? And then I would show them this picture. They like don't move when I walk up to them. They, all they want is the food. They have very, very, very little fear of people. In fact, they would follow me around the settlement when I tried to do population counts to see which of the banded birds was there. I would be counting the same one over and over again because he was just walking around with me. Um, so that was, that was one obstacle in convincing my advisors that this was a viable option because I, I'm not having a huge effect on their fear of the carcass, uh, clearly. So things I would record at these carcasses were the first individual to arrive. If they had a, a leg band, I would know exactly who the individual was, but sometimes you could only record the age class that they fall in. And then every five minutes, I would walk up to the carcass and weigh it, and record the number of birds that had been eating that carcass and the number of birds that were nearby sort of not being allowed to eat at the carcass, their ages, and any vocalizations that they were making. They're pretty noisy birds. They make a lot of vocalizations. And my goal with this was to try and model how carcasses are depleted by scavengers, because it can be really difficult to do this for the reasons why it's really easy to do it with the caracaras. You can't just walk up to a carcass, a moose carcass, in the middle of a forest and weigh it every five minutes if there are ravens eating it. You're going to scare the ravens away for like the next two days. That's not really going to work. So this was a perfect opportunity to set up this whole model to describe how carcasses are depleted by scavengers and how quickly they can be depleted by scavengers. So here are a, a couple results that I went through um, with this. The goose carcasses and the mutton carcasses, they, they weighed a little bit differently. Um, they were discovered uh, at different times, so it took birds about three minutes to discover a goose carcass, but less than a minute to discover a mutton shoulder. Uh, on average, only about five birds could access the carcass at any given time because of how big they are and how small the carcass is. Uh, but in general, they would eat about 80% of the carcass, and it would take them between uh, one and two hours. That's it, to, to strip all the good bits off of each of those carcasses. And so I calculated um, a food per bird statistic, and that's really what I used to determine um, how the different age classes behaved and, and how it was beneficial to them to behave at the carcasses. They could get about 21 grams of goose carcass uh, per bird if uh, they were uh, a mixed group of juveniles and adults. But comparing a group of adults to comparing a group of juveniles showed that there was a pretty big difference there. Adults are fairly dominant uh, and they kind of rule the roost. They'll chase the juveniles away. But if the juveniles can come together in a group of more than five or six individuals at a time, the adults get kind of overwhelmed, and then all the juveniles have access to that carcass. 
It's actually a very similar thing to what uh, Dr. Bernd Heinrich showed happens with ravens. A pair of adult ravens will dominate a carcass, but if a bunch of juvenile, uh, unterritoried birds come in, they can push the adults off and then they actually get to eat. Um, the adult call is also very different from the juvenile call. So that was another thing I was able to uh, easily measure was who's, who's talking, what, what age class is talking, and therefore, what are the birds reading out of this? Are they getting like, hey, come here, there's a carcass, or no, go away, I'm gonna fight you. So the adults do this sort of pair of call where they throw their heads way back past 90 degrees and just scream into the air. And the juveniles just drop their jaw open and <laughs> for you know, as long as they have air in their lungs. Like any good juvenile bird. The, then the second half of my um, uh, experiments was a playback response kind of call. And there's another picture in there. Uh, and I would record their vocalizations while doing the carcass experiments in the hope that I was recording vocalizations that were in reference to food in some way. Um, so during feeding events, I recorded the juvenile and adult calls. I'd isolate them uh, later on in my computer and then create uh, randomized tracks of different individuals calling to play them back in the absence of a carcass and literally just see what happened. Uh, and I also recorded a control track of just regular farm and wind sounds uh, so that I could say if they were being attracted by the vocalizations, by certain vocalizations, or if they were just being attracted by the fact that there was a novel object in their environment, which I have to say, that was a big factor. I got birds showing up to my playback response trials when I just had that little green speaker sitting out in the snow. They would come over and they would pick at it and they took the windsock off of it twice uh, and carried it away and tried to eat it. Uh, when there was no sound coming out of the speaker. It was just a fun thing that was around. So that was really enlightening too. Um, but I, did, I was able to show that um, before the speaker was turned on, those are the sort of the first three bars on the left, there were uh, birds on an average distance of about 100 or 120 meters from the speaker. And then as I started playing, either the adult calls or the juvenile calls, they would actually move closer to the speaker on average to about uh, 60 meters, which really isn't that close on average, but I would have maybe 25 or 30 birds in the environment. But during the control trial, there really wasn't a significant difference between the distances that they moved. They didn't care so much, weren't so curious perhaps about the noises being made by the uh, control speaker demonstration. But almost a, a little bit more interesting than that, I found, was uh, the vocalizations that I recorded during the uh, carcass experiments. There were six instances, and only six instances, where uh, the bird that arrived at the carcass first, who discovered it, didn't vocalize upon arrival, didn't start screaming as soon as they found that good carcass. And for those six trials, before vocalization happened, an average of 0.3 birds per minute would accumulate at the carcass. But then after that first vocalization was made, maybe 20 or 30 minutes in, then the accumulation jumped up to about 0.75 accumulating per minute. Whereas in the rest of the carcasses, the other 17 carcasses where vocalization was immediate, the first bird that arrived was screaming, they would accumulate about 0.71 birds per minute. So to me, that said that the vocalization did have something to do with birds accumulating at the carcass, whether it was, hey everyone, come here, I found this great source of food, or hey everyone, I found this great source of food, stay away, and they were just taking advantage of that call. Um, I didn't know and can't really know, but it seems to be that they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't make that call if it was constantly being parasitized to their detriment. They would find something else to do. So I just wanted to tell the story of these birds because they're so delightful and so curious and just hanging out with them in the island when I wasn't actively doing experiments was so fun too. Uh, one of my colleagues was actually uh, doing little puzzles with them and she constructed this PVC pipe puzzle. It's got uh, red slats in it so that if you pull out one of the slats, a piece of food drops down the tube. Very interesting. So you have to do one task to get the reward. And they figured it out pretty quickly. Um, but it, it did take them some time to figure out like 
what the pieces were. A few of the birds would take out one of the slats and then fly off with it, and you'd see them sitting on a hill, like picking at it, um, which my colleague was very annoyed by because she didn't have an infinite number of those things, and we needed to get them back eventually. Uh, one of the coolest things that we saw was one individual banded bird, his name was E5 White. He had figured out the puzzle uh, in January one year, and she came back after having gone back to school for a while in July, and the same bird came back and did the puzzle again immediately. He had remembered exactly what to do. So that is, that's a whole potential there for testing their intelligence. I had fun doing random things in grad school too. Um, I was involved with uh, Todd Katzner's uh, camera trap program. He's looking at golden eagles uh, in the Intermountain West. So I got to drag uh, deer up a hill <laughs> to set them in front of a camera trap uh, so that when golden eagles arrived, we would uh, be able to identify them. One time we showed up and it wasn't a deer, it was an elk. Um, we still had to drag it up the hill. <laughs> so that's that picture. Uh, and also, random fun stuff happened in the Falklands too. Um, they have oiled penguins every once in a while. The family that I was living with uh, takes great care of their local wildlife. They are sheep farmers, but they care about the penguins too. Whenever penguins show up with oil in their feathers, they go out in the trucks and they round them up and they bring them in and they wash them and then set them free. So I got to be involved with uh, four Gen 2 penguins that, that needed some cleaning there. But ultimately, coming back to grad school and for the other nine months of the year, sitting in my cubicle typing away in my thesis, I thought, ah, you know, I really need to be outside. I really need to be telling this story. I really need to be sharing what I know about these birds with other people. It's not gonna be just one manuscript that gets sent out to a research journal that, you know, 0.01% of the population might maybe think about reading. I want to go back into education, and so that's what I did after graduate school. I got involved with VINs. Um, it was an amazing opportunity to go back to teaching with birds of prey. I had convinced myself that that's what I needed to do, and the, it kind of just fell in my lap, which was really, really awesome. Uh, this is the VINs uh, Welcome Center. For those of you who have not been there, you should come on and visit us. We're open year-round. And that lovely lady on the right is Miss Ogden, our turkey vulture. She is going to be 38 years old in the spring, mm. and she is just a darling deer. And reminds me every day about the importance of teaching people about these scavengers, because they're really, really cool. I also, I don't just do education at VINs. Um, I do a lot of other associated things, which also adds to my enjoyment of the whole thing. It's multiple parts of the whole. So I've uh, developed more our citizen science program. On the left, there's a tree swallow mama in a nest box. We have 16 nest boxes on site, and we're involved in Project Nest Watch through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. I also get to help build our exhibits. Uh, the most recent exhibit we opened was our Adventure Playscape, which is an outdoor natural playground. So there's some kids romping around on the spider web in the playground. And also, I'm still involved, as I was um, at Cornell, with a lot of the behind-the-scenes husbandry stuff. Um, there's me giving a pedicure to a golden eagle, um, which needs to happen twice a year. Birds, nails, and their talons, and their beaks, actually, grow throughout their lives, uh, just like our fingernails do. We can't accurately replicate all the rough surfaces that they would have in the wild, so we do trim back their talons uh, twice a year, which is a severe undertaking. There is, there is 1,500 pounds per square inch of pressure in each of those toes, and so sometimes you just can't pry them open in order to cut them, so that's tough. Um, and then I was, as I was putting this whole thing together, I thought about, you know, what, is, what even is my job? What, what do I do every day? What, how do I describe it accurately to people? And I think uh, this is what I, I got to put together. This is, if you've seen this meme before, this is uh, what people think I do. So as a raptor educator, um, most, mostly what I do is try and convey information I feel really passionate about to people that I hope become just as passionate, but, you know, not always. <laughs> And then I get to do weird, fun, random things at Vince, too. We um, did bird yoga once. We had a birthday party for our wood turtle when she turned 40. And um, in building our forest exhibit, 
we had a taxidermied mink who was blonde because he'd been sitting in the sun for a long time, so we bought brown hair dye and dyed him. That's very, that, very unique nature center experience. And I just, I, I love every bit of it that I get to be involved in. It's, it's very playful. Uh, and I hope that other people can catch on to that contagious, fun feeling that I have. So I think, yeah, that's, that's all that I have to talk about. So I'll, I'll take questions. Thank you. fill up quickly. Yeah. So and the adults and the juveniles are pretty comparable in weight. Um, as in most birds, a, a bird that's out of the nest with all of its feathers is about the same size as an adult bird. Um, they weigh between uh, 14 and 1600 grams. So that's like three to four and a half pounds or so. They're, they're a hefty bird. Um, and that, the food per bird statistic, I reported an average across the entire length of time that the carcass was being picked at. It did change over time. Uh, and one of the really interesting things was it picked up in the first 30 minutes and then declined. So it, it was almost as if you needed a certain amount of birds around the carcass to get the food. And then they, once they ate it, then it started to deplete. But the very first few birds, one individual picking at a carcass, couldn't actually get that much meat off of it until there were five or six mouths tearing in different directions. Yeah. Other questions? We'll have time at the end as well. Up at, Hart Up at Hartland Dam, when you walk across the top of the dam, mm -hmm. uh, there's a sign on the other side where there's a, I think a reservoir for water to come in or something, and something, I don't know if it's kestrels or what, nests at some point. Mm -hmm. What bird is that, and what does that look like if you were actually able to go out and see it sure. when it was really active? Um, I believe it's a peregrine falcon right, okay. at the Heartland Dam, so that's why there's a sign. Peregrine falcons are, um, uh, I don't actually believe they're endangered species in Vermont. The bald eagle still is, but not them. Uh, but they're still very closely monitored by fish and wildlife, so they are cliff nesting birds. Peregrine falcons, if you're familiar, are um, beautiful counter shaded falcons. They've got a black, slaty, black back with a white belly and um, long black stripes under their eyes. Um, they're nesting on a cliff, you might see just a little scrape of rocks and then a bunch of whitewash coming down the side from where they, they poop out of the side of the nest. But that's really all you would see, um, I, I assume, without a really long spotting scope. Are there really like lots of them? Why? They're, about, they're about 60 breeding pairs in Vermont, um, which is phenomenal. Back in 1981, there were zero. Um, and actually, Vince was helping reintroduce peregrines uh, after the DDT crisis, when the peregrine falcon population crashed. Uh, that was in the early 70s. There was a huge effort to bring them back. Uh, the Peregrine Fund, which is headquartered at the World Center for Birds of Prey, was a big part of that. And here in Vermont, Vince was also part of reintroducing them. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. <clears throat> I was just fascinated by your story about uh, 11 year B11 <laughs> and hanging on to that all the way to 17 and 18. Does Vince make it possible for kids as young as 11 to have any part of things? Yay. Yes, it you does. Get into, you get into schools and stuff. Yes, we definitely do. Um, and that was something I was really excited about when I started working at Vince. We have uh, a huge need for volunteers to feed baby birds in the summertime. And we allow kids as young as 10 years old with the supervision of a parent to come and take a baby bird feeding shift. So essentially the same thing I was doing at the Raptor Trust is just every hour, sometimes every half hour, sometimes every 15 minutes, feeding these baby birds from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. Makes me wish I was still 11. <laughs> you could still do it. There's no upper age limit on baby bird feeding at all. All right. Um, 
what is your favorite bird fact or most interesting? What do you find most interesting? <laughs> favorite bird fact? I spend my whole day spewing bird facts at people. I don't know what my favorite one is. Um, I think of a good one. Um, probably, so to me, the weirdest bird fact that I ever learned was that there's a ruminant bird. You know, like ruminants like cows that have you know, foregut fermentation, they have four chamber stomachs. There's a bird called a Watson that lives in South America, and they have foregut fermentation. They eat leaves, and so they, they need that. So there's like a, a bird that has the same digestive system as a cow, which seems ridiculous. And the other thing about them is that um, they're probably from a very ancient lineage of birds because they have a vestigial claw on their wingtip. Um, that the young actually use to climb around. If they're threatened by a predator, they'll actually climb on their wings out of the nest. Yeah, favorite bird fact. So we're gonna save the rest of the questions for the end, just to uh, leave time for our second presenter, but let's give um, a round of applause. Um, this is going to be a, a very different presentation because I was given very different instructions than Anna was. Um, in fact, uh, what I'm used to doing is giving presentations about my work. And I've been doing that for a lot of years. And what I was told tonight is that I'm only supposed to talk about myself, which is really awkward <laughs> for someone who's used to well, being excited by and talking about animals and research. Um, but the other difference that's probably obvious is that I'm considerably Anna Senior. So my education and career and experience uh, started well before the women's rights movement. So I'm sure I have a different array of, of stories and experiences in that way. So um, with that to begin with, I also don't have many slides. I was told originally I couldn't have any, and so as I was becoming apoplectic, they said I could have a few. So you at least, at least get to see pictures of the animals I'm talking about, but there's really just five slides. Um, so with that preface, uh, and hopefully uh, a proper imp um, explanation, my story starts a really long time ago. I was born in 1945, full disclosure. Um, and so things were really different then for women, and expectations were really different for women. I started off being really lucky, and I didn't realize this until I was much older and actually had my own kids, that my mom was amazingly tolerant because I was a tomboy from the beginning. I never wanted to be a boy. I, that never occurred to me, but I wanted to be able to do boy things. I wanted to play outside. I didn't, I wasn't interested in dolls. I wanted to be outside doing things. I wanted to be with animals. And she put up with that. In fact, I remember once around Christmas time, I was in the next room and she was saying to her mother, my grandmother, and this is when I had asked for an electric train for Christmas. <laughs> and she said, but mom, she won't play with dolls. So um, hats off to my mother, who died just a couple of years ago, that she let me be me in an era when that was not common. So um, then my passion for animals goes back as long as my memory does. And the first time I became interested in horses. So the two species I'm focusing on tonight are horses and wolves. And those are the two species I've been most passionate about uh, through my lifetime. But I've also become identified with in terms of research and I get, that means I get more opportunities to stay involved with them, which I'm really happy about, even though I'm supposedly retired. Retired just means I get to live in Vermont. <laughs> and I don't have to get up and go to the office and I don't have to do administrative work. But uh, otherwise, I do still get to do work with animals. So horses were the, my first love. And when I was somewhere around four years old, I grew up in Southern Illinois. And uh, there was a carnival that came through each year. I don't know if you had that kind of experience if you're from my generation uh, here in Vermont. But one of the features was pony rides. So I convinced my mom to let me take a pony ride. So it just goes in a circle in this little ring. But at some point, my pony spooked and reared up 
It was the most exciting thing that had ever happened to me in my life. And I couldn't understand why my mom was screaming over there. I, this is wonderful. So I fell for horses, but we didn't have enough money for me to have a horse. I never was allowed to have my own horse. But this was kind of a horse era because that was the time of Westerns. So I then fell for Roy Rogers. Like every night, you know, I come over, afternoon, come over from school, and there's like a half an hour or so of Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. Dale Evans is the critical person here. Um, <laughs> that Dale Evans was the only woman at that time that rode a horse astride. So think about this, if you're a little kid and you're looking for role models, even though you don't know you're looking for a role model, all the other women in those westerns were in a buggy or a carriage or a wagon of some kind, or if they rode a horse, they rode side saddle. Dale Evans was astride and Roy Rogers was a sheriff and so she went out with him chasing bad guys. This was amazing to me. So that somehow inspired me that yes, Girls can do that too. But I still didn't have my own horse. Uh, so I looked for horses wherever I could, any friends and whatever. Uh, but it all came together for me, or the beginning of it came together for me in graduate school, which was pretty far along, that I actually had the opportunity to do research with horses. This was at University of Wisconsin in the veterinary science department. And uh, so my research focused on endocrinology and reproductive physiology, when you heard my bio at the beginning, which is hormones and behavior. And uh, this was the first time anyone had done this in vet science. I was the only woman in the lab, uh, but the professor had decided all of the people who had come through his lab were just doing physiology, nobody knew how to do behavior, and he wanted someone to start doing scientific studies of behavior, so that was my opportunity. So I spent four and a half years working with horses on a farm just outside of Madison, Wisconsin, um, in heaven, um, because I had my hands on them almost every day. It was really wonderful, and getting to know them in a way that was even more than I would have if I'd been riding a horse. Um, especially because one of the things I had to do on a regular basis is put my arm up the rear end of a horse, uh, if any of you know anything about cattle, it's called rectal palpation, and you can reach in, and you have a glove on, uh, but you can actually feel the ovaries, and you can feel follicles on the ovaries, and you know when the female ovulates, all of that. So I was really intimate with horses during that time. Um, so when my uh, grad program came to an end, I, during that time I'd become fascinated with also adaptations and evolution. And horses are really different than a lot of other species in many ways. Their social system is different, their physiology is different, and I really wanted to have a chance to look at them in a natural environment and try to figure out in some way what kinds of factors in that environment might have influenced the evolution of this species to be so different from the other ungulates. Their social system is more like primates. It's a group of females and a male that are loyal to each other. The females have very close relationships. The male stays with them year round outside the breeding season. That's unusual in ungulates, unheard of in ungulates. And so there was really something interesting going on there. So a friend of mine, a woman, uh, who's only a couple of years older than I am, had done her PhD research in Death Valley with feral burrows, so that was a really big deal. Uh, and so she and I put in a re research proposal to, uh, I think it was National Geographic, and we were going to go to Mongolia and study wild horses, the, the true wild horse, with the, which is the Shvalsky horse there, and we got turned down. Uh, so anyway, I thought, okay, what else will I do? And <clears throat> I, <laughs> so, I need to back up now because there's, here's where my stories about horses and wolves overlap. Um, so maybe what I'll do is jump ahead and tell you about the rest of the horse story and then come back to wolves. So I, 
I had my actual opportunity to go out in the field and study horses, and this is not truly wild horses, but feral horses, which are, which are domestic horses that have gone wild. And that's what we have in the Western US here. Um, and so I got a call from someone at the University of Wisconsin saying, we've been looking all over the country and you're the only person we can find who's ever vasectomized a stallion. So if you think about it, and I'm not even a vet, in those days, uh, physiologists were expected to do their own surgeries, so I had learned to do that. I'd had a surgery class. Um, horses, male horses are castrated, then they're a gelding. People don't bother vasectomizing. They want to control their behavior, not just their reproduction, so they castrate them. I had done vasectomies as part of my research, so they needed this done as a fertility control study that was run by the Bureau of Land Management out in Nevada. So, <clears throat> they had, in 1972, uh, the Wild Horse and Burrow Act was passed, which made it against the law to harass or kill horses or burrows on federal land, public land. So this would be National Park Service, Forest Service, or Bureau of Land Management land. And most of Nevada, something like 80%, is federal land. And uh, grazing rights are leased to ranchers for their cattle. But that land is multi-use. And it's designated multi-use. So there are also horses on that land, these feral horses, that were turned out, actually, most of them after the Second World War, when tractors became common and horses lost value and it wasn't possible to make much for selling them, so they just let them go. Uh, there are only three places out west where there's anything that looks like genetically unique horses that might have Spanish background, like Spanish Mustang. Most of the ones out there are really just generic uh, domestic horses that have gone wild. So uh, the Bureau of Land Management was charged with maintaining numbers of horses because they reproduce really well and they have no predators out there because the ranchers made sure that wolves and mountain lions were killed long ago uh, in the 1800s. Uh, so horses are benefiting, benefiting from that because they don't have predators either. So numbers were skyrocketing. And so what BLM started doing was uh, helicopter roundups, and they would bring those horses in and put them up for adoption. So that's where you can tell that they are really domestics at heart, because if you take those horses when they're young, they make really good saddle horses. They can be broken and used. And even now, somewhere between two and 5,000 are still adopted out each year. Uh, so that's the helicopter up at the top doing a roundup. And that's me, you have to believe it's me since it's from the back and I'm on, all bundled up on a February cold day vasectomizing a stallion <laughs> somewhere in the middle of Nevada. Um, so when I first started going out there, it was just to be for two two-week periods to do these surgeries at two different locations. But at the end of that time, they decided they really needed to hire someone else uh, to go out and do on-the-ground tracking that they had put radio collars on the stallions and there was a, a man from Minnesota who was going to do the helicopter <coughs> surveys, but something went wrong with those collars and the radio uh, parts started coming off, the radio transmitters started coming off, but we had done really careful um, uh, photos and descriptions, because horses vary if you've been around them much. They have different face markings and leg markings and colors and such. And so we could pretty well tell them apart just by those descriptions. So they looked at me and said, is there any chance you'd like to do that? And I raised my hand really fast, uh, because I'd been living in Manhattan, in New York City, working on another short-term grant uh, doing ultrastructure of sperm, which is looking at sperm in a dark room under an electron microscope. Uh, and I was ready to get out of the city. So I went from living in a studio apartment in Manhattan to a tent 
by myself in the middle of the Nevada desert. Well, not by myself, I had my dog. Um, so I spent two years out there following these bands that had been altered, so the stallion now cannot reproduce, and comparing them to bands where the stallion was intact to see if there re really was a decrease in foal production. Would fertility control make a difference in this species uh, as part of population management? So. Uh, clearly, I understood the potential application of this for conservation of that ecosystem. But for me, as a kid who'd grown up in this little town in southern Illinois and enjoyed most of my childhood walking around the woods uh, by myself out behind my grandparents' farm, well before the days of helicopter parenting, it amazes me now to think about, given how car careful parents are now, that we were just sent out in the morning and we went out and played for the day. I was out in the woods by myself out there in the middle of nowhere and I would just get hungry and come home for lunch and go out again and that was normal. Uh, but here I was, <clears throat> and I was 30 something at this time, hiking around out in Nevada and somebody was paying me. I mean, I was pinching myself all the time, like this is what I would pay them if I had enough money. Uh, to do that, and so part of the time I had a saddle horse and part of the time I was hiking if the terrain was better for hiking. So this was truly um, you know, like a dream come true for me. I got to be a, sort of a, a cowgirl uh, professionally like that. Uh, so I don't know if you can tell from back in the back, but this is the usual view. There are about six or seven horses there. So I'm up on a, a overlook, you know, counting and observing for that day. Most of the time, I wasn't as close as you see these coming up to a water hole. Um, okay, so what about wolves? <clears throat> well, when I got, <laughs> there, there is a convergence. Uh, I was invited, right after grad school, or right about at the time of the end of grad school, I was invited to a wild horse conference out in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And it actually was about this kind of project uh, that BLM was bringing scientists together to talk about just you know, like basic science and reproductive physiology and getting some ideas of things that might be done to control fertility. And so I gave a presentation about my graduate research. Uh, I didn't care about BLM. I didn't realize there was that kind of possibility. But at that meeting, I met a man from Minnesota who worked with wolves. And we started talking, and it turned out some research I had done as an undergrad at University of Wisconsin at the Wisconsin Regional Primate Center with pheromones. So this is like olfactory communication you know, by scent with monkeys. I had learned some techniques that they needed for a grant they had just gotten. So I got hired to go to Minnesota and work with wolves using a monkey technique. Um, you know, you can't plan this kind of thing. Um, but the other most exciting part was that I was gonna be working with Dave Meech, who is Mr. Wolf biologist in the world, then and now. And that's important for a whole bunch of reasons, but one of the big ones is, in 1974, when I was just starting to look at where I wanted to go to grad school, so I finished my undergrad at Wisconsin as deciding what am I gonna do in the next stage of my life, and I'd had a wildlife ecology course, and I really liked it, and there was someone in wildlife ecology department that studied wolves, and in the 70s, wolves were just becoming popular. Uh, that was when the Endangered Species Act had just been passed in 1973. The wolf was the icon of that movement, and I'd become fascinated by them. I had done a paper for class and read everything I could, and here's somebody in wildlife ecology who studies wolves. So I made an appointment. At that time, you go see the department chair. So I walked in, and I started to tell them about my interest very polite, older gentleman, and just said to me very nicely, I'm sorry, we don't take women. Door closed, that's it. I was flabbergasted, and I'm not a confrontational person. <laughs> As Todd will tell you, he's always telling me I should be more confrontational at times, it's just not me. 
I have felt like throughout my whole career, I just needed to work harder. I was working in a man's world and I just had to work harder and prove myself and so, okay, I'll just find something else to do. But a year into my postdoc with Wolves, the zoology department asked me to come back to Wisconsin to give a presentation. The guy in wildlife ecology is not well known for wolves. It was just my link, it was the only thing I knew at the time. So I go back to Wisconsin to give a talk about my postdoc research with wolves, working with Dave Meach, and I wore high heels to make it clear I was a girl, <laughs> and I looked out in the audience there was the chairman from wildlife ecology. So I was in zoology, but Wisconsin was and still is very interdisciplinary, so uh, seminars are advertised all across campus. He had walked across campus to see a woman giving a talk about wolves. So people would say, well, did you go up to him? Did you say anything? They're like, no, I just needed the satisfaction that he was there and I had done it. So just one of those little milestones. But I did have a wonderful experience with wolves. It was only three years, uh, but I learned a lot. I even got to raise a litter of puppies the first year I was there, because our, one of our strategies was, if you've hand raised a wolf, you can get up to them, you can get a blood sample, you can you know, get measurements and such without stressing them. So we wanted some wolves that were in a more natural kind of setting and that were afraid of humans and such, but we also wanted some that weren't afraid of humans. And so those wolves I had, until they died, a good relationship with. I was their mom. So that was pretty special as well, and I learned a lot. But the grant came to an end after three years, and so I had to decide what to do with the rest of my life, and I was about 40 then, and I thought maybe I need a real job. And so uh, the St. Louis Zoo offered me an incredible position, and I know there aren't any zoos in Vermont, and my impression from talking to people is that people are look askance at zoos, and I understand that. Um, I think all of us who care about animals and wildlife and ecosystems would rather see animals out there. I absolutely feel that and believe it. But I also understand the need so many people have to see animals and get up close and have that experience and the role that zoos can play in education and from my perspective, the role they can play in research. We can learn more about those animals so we know how to make more informed choices and recommendations when we are doing conservation. And if you've not paid attention, modern zoos really are conservation organizations. Uh, okay, so that's the end of that soapbox, but I did then go to work for the St. Louis Zoo and they told me I could do anything I wanted. They just wanted to begin a program and they didn't know how, how to uh, actually construct it. It was up to me. So I felt like a kid in a candy store because I had become, I had a chance to work with a lot of different species, even by then. And the idea of comparative reproductive systems still is fascinating to me. If you think about it, every species has to reproduce, but, well, if you're not a reproductive physiologist, you probably don't realize they do it in so many different ways. All these uh, adaptations that have come about that actually are species isolating. Part of what makes a species is they don't interbreed, uh, <clears throat> and reproductive physiology and behavior is, is part of that. So that's what I was really attracted to, uh, being able to work at the zoo and work with any of those species that were there. So I had an incredible career there and an incredible number of opportunities, but when I took that job, they didn't have wolves. So, and of course they didn't have horses. Uh, so I thought, well, this is gonna be you know, a whole new world for me. But very soon after that, I started in 1988, and in 1990, excuse me, I'm getting over a cold, um, <clears throat> someone from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Mexican Wolf Recovery Team came to visit me and wanted to know if I would be willing to work with them to start a gene bank. And at that time, a gene bank meant sperm. And in 2005, we were able to add eggs to that. Uh, but ever since 1990, every breeding season, <clears throat> which means the month of February, 
I'm basically on the road working with wolves. So the zoo was happy to let me do that. The zoo is still funding that bank physically that it is there. The liquid nitrogen and maintenance and such is still sitting at the zoo and they've committed to keep doing that till the end of time. And Fish and Wildlife Service is still paying for me to go do that work every breeding season. So we're starting the plans now um, already for upcoming February. So that, I, the, the way that came together, I guess for me throughout my career, anything I thought I was going to plan and make happen never worked. But what did work for me was recognizing opportunities and just taking them. And there were times when I felt like I'd hear you know, my colleagues, and most of which were male because I was in science, um, that they were looking for the perfect career trajectory. You have to get this degree, and then you have to do this postdoc, and then you prepare yourself. And I thought, you know, I just want to enjoy this. It's more like girls just want to have fun. Um, and I had children. Um, I have two grown sons and three grandkids. So somehow in there, I made that work. Um, but I didn't feel like I needed the perfect academic career. I wanted a fulfilling career that let me do things that I love to do. And when I talk about alternative careers, um, and I get asked to do that now and then because I'm not a, I wasn't a tenure track academic <clears throat> because they don't have enough species. I would have been bored. I didn't want to do lab rats. Um, it's really hard for students now because of the cost of education. I paid nothing. I have a PhD and I paid nothing. I had scholarships and fellowships all the way through. Plus, it was less expensive then. Uh, and I, it's daunting to think what students face now and the opportunities that they don't have that I had because the cost of living was less and well, part of the reason I wanted to move to Vermont is it feels kind of like Wisconsin did in the 70s, but that, you know, the, a simpler lifestyle living in the country and not all the accoutrements of the city, I really like that. That works for me. Um, but, so I'm coming to the end. I actually have been able to work with horses again, but in a slightly different way. This is a report from the National Academy of Sciences that came out just a few years ago. In 2011, they tracked me down and asked me to serve on a National Academy committee that met for two years to completely reevaluate BLM's management of feral horses on Western Rangeland. Horses and burrows. There are burrows, but most in number, it really is horses. And in fact, last week, I was in Albuquerque for two days for a workshop still hashing out uh, BLM practices. BLM is still living in the 1970s. Uh, of all the research that's been done since then, they're not implementing any of it, and Congress has given them a mandate that they must do something different. Um, so we're trying to do workshops now to bring people together to show them, okay, here's how it works, we can hold your hand, we can show you how to do this. Because uh, there are a number of uh, fertility control, contraceptive or sterilization methods that are available now and can represent this compromise between the horse advocates and the ranchers. Uh, the ranchers don't want horses there because they're paying for grazing rights. The horse advocates say, but horses have always, always been there. Uh, they're sort of the symbol of the West and horses are charismatic. I had dinner on Friday night in Albuquerque with the Fish and Wildlife Service woman who manages the, um, so I work mostly with Mexican wolves, and they have been released into Arizona, New Mexico. So their, their original range was southwestern U.S. and Mexico, so it's a binational program, and we work very closely with our Mexican colleagues, and so I could tell her, Maybe things are worse for BLM than they are for you in terms of the furor about managing horses uh, compared to, uh, there are wolf advocates, but they are not as rabid as horse advocates. And it's amazing to me how, you know, you've got ranching agriculture interests on one side, and then you have people who really value the animals on the other, 
And we have to work at ways to get them to talk civilly. Hmm, that has a ring to it, doesn't it? Uh, to each other, to try to come to, like, it requires some compromise. You're not gonna get everything you want. You know, there's not a magic bullet to do this. Uh, we have to figure out a, a way to make this work so we're not just angry at each other all the time. What a note to end on. <laughs> Thank you. We'll take questions now. Um, so, Cheryl, what was the result of your research on the sterilization of the horses? It worked. The study was designed, and then I was hired into it. And what they, so it was designed, so, okay. The horse social system is one male and a group of females, three to five females and their offspring. And yet there's 50-50 sex ratio, so there are extra males around. They're either bachelors or sometimes they're a subordinate in the band. So the question, the way that people had designed this grant was that we would only treat the band stallion, the big guy, and they wanted to know whether this would be sufficient. So it's actually a stupid management strategy, but it's a really interesting scientific question. And lo and behold, the band stallions do sequester the males. And never was a bachelor close at all. Although, if it's the stallion's daughter, he'll let her go have little courtship musings with bachelors and then she comes back in. But if it's one of the adult mares, he'll have none of it. Uh, there were a couple of cases where females late summer got pregnant to a subordinate in the band. And we think that's because they usually get pregnant in one or two cycles, in April, May, like the first couple of cycles of the season. But if they're not getting pregnant because the male can't impregnate them, then they have a cycle every three weeks through the end of the season. So there are lots of opportunities for a young male in the group to sneak a copulation. And it's harder and harder for the, uh, the older male to make sure he's kept uh, the, the females protected all that time. But that was a small percentage over the whole population. So it's actually one of the things we recommend for population control is even chemical vasectomy of males, which would be easier than surgical. Chair, sure, thank you an awful lot for coming and presenting. Much, much appreciated. Anna talked a little bit about the cognitive functioning with raptors, their ability to, to learn, to remember, to uh, recognize and communicate. Tell us a little bit about wolves and their ability. That's interesting on a number of levels. Um, and I was thinking about that when I saw that I was being paired with a raptor biologist tonight. I have always felt like the hunter had to be smarter in a way, had to be had to be able to think up strategies in a way that the hunted didn't have to. Um, but there also are people that are doing, mainly a lab out of University, or no, Michigan State University, that are looking at carnivores in particular and social carnivores and brain capacity, intelligence, problem solving and such. I don't know if that's what you're getting at, um, but Wolves have a fairly complex social system, uh, but not as complex as um, hyenas. Hyenas have large clans, and it seems that hyenas may be smarter in that way. They, have, they benefit by being able to not just recognize all those individuals, but learn and remember all the relationships in terms of who's a friend, who's not, who's dominant, who's more subordinate, all of those uh, you know, primary, secondary relationships. And so they may be the epitome from what we know right now, but wolves are up there too. Wolves don't have groups that large, but the social carnivores probably are more intelligent, as with primates. I mean, if you have a large social group, needing to learn that, not just the identities, but all those relationships in order to be successful in that group seems to be what drives that intelligence. Other questions? Yeah. I just had a question about the, uh, the wolves. You said that um, 
you had a relationship with each wolf that you raised from babyhood uh, until their death. Well, how long do they live? So wolves um, in captivity can live till they're oh, somewhere between 12 and 15, kind of like a, a large dog. Um, in the wild, they would seldom make it to 10 even because you know life is tougher. Yeah, um, my best memory, you know, and I had the slide in at first and then I took it out. I thought maybe I didn't want to go down that road. But I was, so I raised that wolf litter the first year I was there. I was there for three years. After I'd been gone a couple of years, I had a chance to come back and visit. And I just wondered how much they remembered me, because they would be five or so years old then. And um, they were in these big packs. So my favorite <laughs> was in a pack. Oh, he had a wife and you know a family. So he had a maid and a family. And because I had kind of clothes on, I didn't want to get dirty and hoopy. Um, one of the technicians who was living there, a caretaker, gave me his overalls to put on because I thought, well, he's going to jump up and want to touch me. But when I walked in, he didn't recognize me at first. I think it's because I looked different and smelled different. So I just started talking to him. So the kids had never met me. They're just you know, way back in the back of the enclosed area going crazy. The female started looking like something might be familiar when he realized it was me. He ran over to me, flipped over on his back, and started peeing. <laughs> and I had to scratch his tummy. And so, I mean, he's an adult, great big old wolf, you know, like 80 or 90 pounds, and he's got his family to protect. I was his mom forever. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, I have a question. I have a question to um, to uh, add to that. I'm not sure. If, uh, I, I had a question um, prior to myself, so it might be the same. Um, the um, in, in studying the, the wolves uh, in the wild and um, the, the example that you just gave with um, the uh, wolves that are friendly to you because you raise them. Did you find that um, that they are treated differently with other wolves in the wild um, as a family? Um, I'm not sure if I'm asking. Yeah, so we may have to discuss and figure out exactly what you mean. Something I didn't make clear is that most of the work that I was doing in Minnesota was at a captive colony that was out in the country because they actually wanted uh, you know, like samples and close-up data, it's really hard to even get up and see wolves in the wild. Most of the information they have on wolves in the wild is from radio collars. Um, so Dave Meech, who had been working in northern Minnesota and just relying on radio collars and occasional trapping, uh, managed to set up a research colony outside of the Twin Cities so he could ask this other array of questions where you need to be able to actually get up and observe the animals and occasionally touch the animals. So I went out into the field with him, but most of my direct research was at that colony. So I wasn't watching hand-raised animals released into the wild. That would probably be a bad idea because those animals we would be less afraid of humans in general and might approach humans and get in trouble, cause trouble. And in fact, in the Mexican wolf reintroductions, even though all of those animals originally were born in captivity, they were extinct in the wild and they were brought back from captive bred animals. They were released and they knew what to do, but they go through a pre-release program beforehand, Fish and Wildlife Service has a facility in central New Mexico, Sevilla, um, near Roswell, um, and, uh, sort of out in the middle of nowhere, and the wolves are put out there and they don't see anyone except maybe once a week somebody brings in a pile of food and kind of puts it over there and goes away. And they're sometimes even hazed, like harassed a little bit, so they start not liking having, human, human, having humans around because the last thing you want is for wolves out in the wild to be approaching humans because that's only going to come to bad. So is that what you were getting at? Um, um, yes, and also I was wondering if you noticed, well, like you're saying, that they were far away, but did you find that the uh, friendlier ones to, to humans were possibly discriminated 
by the wild one. You know what I mean? Because no, well, the, when you're saying the wild ones, you mean the others the, in the captive colony that had not been hand raised? No, no. If anything, I saw cases where a non hand raised wolf would see a hand raised wolf interacting with a human regularly and would become more comfortable with that human. Um, so it actually was the opposite kind of thing. They actually became more confident themselves or more comfortable themselves in having humans up close. They were learning from the one one. Right, they were, they were learning from the interaction that those other animals were having. Yeah. Um, I had a question about, both of you talk about moments of maybe not like isolation, but being by yourself somewhere. And how did that contribute to your work, maybe your overall mindset? Yeah, I think all the people, not just women, but all the people I know who do field work are in a way loners, are really comfortable with themselves and being alone. In fact, my close friend that I almost went to Mongolia with, it probably would have been a disaster because and we're still good friends, but she can't stand being too close, I mean physically very close, very long. She needs to be on her own. She was meant to be in a tent somewhere, you know, she's been work she's been in the Serengeti, you know, her whole adult life. And I so I think there are people who gravitate to that because that's their personal comfort zone. Um, and that's I think that's innate. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I think, and I think that's also a common theme with animal people. People who enjoy working with animals, find themselves attracted to working with animals, is they're not necessarily very social human people, uh, and that's the whole connection exists there. But um, yeah, I lived virtually by myself in the Falklands for two months, and it was delightful. Um, I had a great time. I I don't know that I would want to do it again immediately. Um, it's nice to see my parents and my friends and my boyfriend again, but um, also that I, it never bothered me. I'm also, I'm an only child, so I kind of grew up by myself too. I was almost an only child. My sister is six and a half years younger. <laughs> I was an only child for a while. <laughs> Any other final questions? We're, we're all going to um, spend some time together um, and you can help yourself to food and drink too if there's not any final questions. Yes, right. I I just had one question, uh, given that bo both of you. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I mean, the, the two of you each entered the science field and began doing research in different eras. Um, you said you were the only woman in the lab. I don't think you had that experience. Could you maybe just each of you talk a little bit about what it was like to be? a woman in science, and in your case, the changes that you've seen? Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully change, right. Full disclosure, that's my mother. Um, <laughs> um, and I, you know, when Kevin was talking to me about this program, saying, you know, can you speak about your experience as a woman in science? And I have to say, I really don't have those stories. The story of, sorry, we don't take women. I, that's, things have definitely changed. I will say that um, all of my mentors along the way, Dr. Parks in the Rapid Program, Dr. Goldstein, um, my boss at Vince, Chris Collier, he's a great guy, they're all men. And all, all of the people, the sort of higher up people who I was working for, working towards their position in Raptor biology are all men. And yet, the people in the Raptor Program, my fellow students who would actually be on the ground taking care of the birds, scrubbing bird poop off of walls, and doing these educational programs were mostly women. Uh, and there's a, a hallway in the Cornell Veterinary College that has a class photo of every um, class that has passed through the Veterinary College since it opened. And it starts out all men the first few years, and then there's one or two women, and then there's three or four women, and then by the end there's like one or two men. So it's totally flipped over, at least the veterinary field, um, in that way. Um, many of my colleagues at Vince today are women. My uh, our uh, fellow AmeriCorps member Anna, her name's also Anna, <laughs> uh, works in our education department, and there's uh, another woman that's joining us for the winter season. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of women in my field at least these days. Yeah, 
Yeah, and I think that I've had the same more recent experience, and um, I'm not a vet, but I'm often asked to give talks in vet schools, and I've seen those same walls, uh, pictures, and even, I think in biology, and especially, not, and even in medicine some, but where you're dealing with animals and animal behavior and such, it really is predominantly female now. Uh, that has definitely changed. And when I was sort of coming up through the ranks, I, actually, I want to say good things about my male mentors. They were great. I mean, okay, the one guy said we don't take women. But the men that I did work for, I didn't feel like discriminated against me at all. I, you know, that since they had accepted me, I guess that meant they accepted women. Although the, when I first started in Minnesota, so Dave Meach was mostly in the field, and I, I worked more closely, at least early on, with someone else who was looking askance at women. And he actually, after about six months in, came to talk to me and told me that basically I'd made it. He had watched how I dealt with people, and I wasn't just a silly girl, and I seemed so serious and intelligent. And so he was great with me forever after. I didn't realize I was being evaluated like that, which is probably good. Um, but you know, he was then a good mentor for me for a long time. I worked for a couple of men who were jerks. But I think they were jerks to everybody, not just to women. So I've not personally had that problem. And the men that were in, I've only had, I've only worked with one man who I thought discriminated against me because I was women, a woman. He was resentful that I had been given a position he wanted, and he was he was really nasty to me. Um, but I mean, that's one in bunches and bunches uh, who were accepting and you know. My personal feeling is that in science, it's a little more egalitarian and that you know men are a little more forward thinking and more accepting. And I mean, maybe that's my biased opinion, but it's definitely my opinion. I've not had those problems. And, and maybe too, if you can demonstrate that you have a particular skill, then it doesn't matter what your gender is. You, someone needs you to do this job and you have this skill. So I just want to do a final round of applause and thank you. Um,